guys haven't been here for like two weeks, or actually I haven't been in here for two weeks. I was off one week, and then last week I was with the kids. So um, Josh is with the kids today. Um, I would rather be with the kids probably, but hey, I'm here, and so sorry, tough luck for you. Um, which, oh, look at that. Isn't that cool? Love no matter what. I um, thought I'd just tell you a little bit about what's coming up. I'll tell you maybe what has happened and what is happening now and what's coming up in the future. Obviously, we've been in the Gospel of Mark for a while now, and we're going to kind of go up, I think, to the point where, like at Easter, we did the Bethany thing where the woman anoints um, Jesus' feet with oil, his head with oil, the whole thing. So we're going to go all the way up to 13 to where he gets to Jerusalem, and he's going to then go to the cross, and we're going to stop and we're going to do a four-week series called Love No Matter What. If you haven't figured out through the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is about loving people no matter what, then we have failed you miserably. I mean, all you have to do is go back and reread Mark a few times. I don't know if any of you have done that. I do that like once a week. I just go back to the first chapter and then start reading it all the way to where we're at now. And it's like, oh my gosh. Jesus is always just reaching farther and farther out to people who probably haven't experienced, don't even know that God cares about them, and he absolutely loves them no matter what. And so that's the series title. It's kind of based on a few books by a guy named um, Bob Goff. Do you may know who that is? Uh, Love Does, which is about action. Jesus is all about action, right? I mean, he's immediately going here, immediately going there, immediately going to help somebody and heal them and cast out a demon or something. He's just teaching everywhere, and, and he's all about action. And then this, the other book that he wrote is Everybody Always, which is basically about are you able to love absolutely everyone you see, no matter what. And so Love No Matter What is kind of our series in the fall, and that's, we're kind of moving toward, and then after that, we're going to head right into the cross. And so if anybody comes, they're going to understand the love of God shown to them through the cross of Jesus and how much he cares and what he did for us and sacrificed everything for us. And so that's kind of where we've been, where we're at, and where we're headed. You cool with that? Hey, I just, I just want to say hi. Um, so we're in the Gospel of Mark. We've been here for a while. And um, um, here, have you heard about these new things? This is kind of cool. Have you heard about multifocal contact lenses? Multifocal contact lenses. I have some on right now. Now, uh, I don't know. This isn't about age, right? So no matter if I'm 52 or 63 or 75, it doesn't matter because this happened to me when I was like 19 in college. I realized I couldn't see the board from like way far away. And I'd never really experienced that before because I had always sit. No, I didn't sit close. I wasn't a teacher's pet in high school. Heck no, I was in the back. Um, but I never looked at the board. <laughs> That's what happened. I just didn't care. Um, anyway, um, I've been wearing contacts for a long time. But my problem is... I read all the time. That's all I do. I'm constantly reading. I look here. And um, if I have contacts in that only focus far away that I can't see, I can't read. I have to use these little cheater glasses, old people glasses, whatever you want to call them. I'm old, so I, let's call them cheaters. Um, so I haven't been wearing contacts for a long time because it's irritated me because I can read fine without glasses or contacts. It's kind of how I do it. Um, but these new multifocal contacts, I was at the eye doctor this week, and he says, hey, let's try these things. <clears throat> so I can literally read far away with my contacts, but I can also open up the Bible and read at the same time. Now, this is revolutionary. It's amazing. It's, I ask him about the engineering. How do they do that? I don't know. And I don't know either. But it is awesome. And... Um, and I think you're going to need some multifocal contact lenses as well because this passage literally, I mean, it's a chunk here, a chunk there, a chunk. I mean, there's so many different things happening in this passage. you got to focus here, and it's kind of a little close, and focus there, and it's a little far away. There's so many different things going on. You're going to need to have many ways of focusing. Now, I think in the end, I can bring it all together, but, but the chunks are just weird, are different. Okay? Now, we've been in the Gospel of Mark, you know that, but we are now at a place where he's coming away from Mark chapter 8, huge chapter, right? And hopefully you've been with us for a while, and so you know what happened up 
in Caesarea Philippi, a monumentous occasion where the disciples finally, after spending time with Jesus and watching him do all the things he's done and healing people and, and casting out demons and teaching in a way that people just, it resonated with their soul. It's like, yes, this is truth. I know this is truth. He even raised people from the dead, fed thousands of people. They're, they're wondering, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And we go, he's Jesus. He's the Messiah. Come on, aren't you so slow? Finally, they get to Caesarea Philippi. He asks, who do people say that I am? Eh, some prophet, Elijah, I don't know. But who do you say that I am? Peter, I think you're the Christ. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And he goes, yes, that's awesome. Now, you need to know how I'm going to complete my mission. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed and the whole thing. And Peter says, no way. And if you remember the passage... Uh, get behind me, not Peter, but Satan. You, you don't understand what I'm doing. Now, we're going to hear in this passage, he's going to once again say, now, I need you to tell you that I'm the Messiah, yes, but I'm now going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to people, and they're going to kill me. And, and once again, like, it's amazing. He does it three times in this gospel. And every time afterward, the disciples act like complete, um, you fill in the, name, the word. They're just... Moron. Okay, sure, we'll go with moron. How, how moronic can you be? He just said something very important and sacrificial, and he's going to give his life, and then you say that? You argue about that? You want that? It's like, these guys are really, really slow. I mean, it's kind of like trying to um, train a really obstinate puppy. I, I know exactly what that's about right now. It's, Little Molly just keeps on dumping in the kitchen. It's just driving me crazy. But that's what the disciples are. They're just like messing on the kitchen floor over and over and over. And Jesus is just going, I can't believe it. But he's going to teach them. He's going to really focus his teaching over the next few weeks to help the disciples understand what it's like to now live in the kingdom of God. If you're going to be a leader in the kingdom of God, this is how it's going to be. Now, let me just read this real quick and... Um, and then we'll dive into it. I, I ran a little long the first one, so I don't want to do that again. Um, once again, if you put the little first slide up, they were up in Caesarea Philippi, and we'll talk a little bit about that. They're coming off of Mount Hermon, right? They came, uh, just three of them went and saw Jesus reveal himself in all of his glory. They were amazed by it. Peter was so, he wet himself, dropped on his knees and said, can I build you a tent? Oh, that was stupid. You know, and Jesus just went... <laughs> Seriously? A tent? Are you kidding? Okay. Um, anyway, and then they came down the mountain, and they saw the other disciples, and they couldn't cast out demons. So that's what's happened over the last few weeks here at church, and you've been a part of that. And now they're going to leave Mount Hermon and Caesarea Philippi and go back to the Galilee. So verse 30 in chapter 9 says, They left that place, meaning Caesarea Philippi, and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. See, he was focusing his teaching only on his disciples, not the crowd. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. So they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? I think he did it with a little glisten in his eye. But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest, like among themselves. Who was the greatest among themselves? Seriously? Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. And teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. And here we get a little bit more difficult. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. 
It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Now, here's how it usually works for a pastor guy when those last two verses occur, especially like the last eight verses occur. You try to waste a lot of time in the first couple of verses so you don't have to get to that. Because that last stuff, right? That's weird. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. Have salt in yourselves. What does that mean? Well, if I play it right, we won't get to it. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, let's start in the beginning. It's easier up there. They've been up in Caesarea Philippi. Enormous, enormous things have happened in the life of the disciples and seen who Jesus was. Oh my gosh, you're the Christ. Yes, good. And then they are, re- I mean, Jesus reveals himself to a couple of them. I mean, this is enormous. It should have really been s- still on their minds, right? For, for a long time, if you really saw the glory of God revealed in front of you, w- it would change you, right? You'd be talking about it for months. Well, who knows? Because the disciples did it, and it doesn't seem like they did it. It says they left that place after they were up in Caesarea Philippi amongst the pagans, amongst the people who did horrible things. And Jesus says to them, hey, if anyone wants to come after me, anyone, he he basically says to all these pagans, if any of you would like to follow me, just deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And then he says, even amongst the horrible pagans and the horrible things they're doing, if anyone tries to save their life, they're going to lose it. But whoever gives up their life for me, And my cause, my gospel, you'll find your life. And so the the doors have literally been flung open wide. And we've seen this in the gospel, right? We've seen that Jesus first started hanging out with people in the Jewish community that no one else liked, no one else wanted to hang out with. They were marginalized, ostracized, completely set aside. The leper, the person who had this issue of blood, who, who nobody wanted to be out, the tax collectors and other notorious sinners, what the scriptures say. He's hanging out with people that no one else wanted to be with. And then he starts not just hanging out with the Jewish community who's doing that. He's starting to hang out with Gentiles, people who aren't even following God. They're not the chosen people of God. He goes up north and casts out a demon from a woman. Her child is struggling and handles that and then goes across the sea to the place where the Gentiles are and he feeds them all. And then he goes up north with those horrible people up in Caesarea Philippi. So he's continually expanding the boundaries of people who who he's going to welcome in. And then they leave there. And it's funny because when he got there, he asked who they thought he was. They shared that he was the Messiah, and he told them for the first time, now I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Now that you know who I am, now that you know that I'm the Messiah, this is my identity, now I'm going to show you and tell you how I'm going to accomplish my mission, and it's going to be by going to the cross. Now, he doesn't say the cross, but he says, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be handed over to men. I'm going to be killed, but three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead, and they really don't understand. They really don't understand. And I know this because the very next thing they're thinking about after he once again tells them, hey, we're going to go back to Galilee. Now, this is what I think he did. He says, hey, guys, we're going to go back to where we, you know, we've been staying. And, and just to let you know, be, before we go, I want to tell you again, right, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They're going to kill him, and after three days, he will rise. Okay, you ready to go? Go. And, and he just starts walking. And so what do you think they're talking about, right? I mean, Peter, James, and John are not supposed to tell anyone that God has revealed himself, Jesus revealed himself on the top of the mountain. They can't say that to anyone, but I got to believe they're talking amongst themselves, right? Oh my gosh, did you see that? And we were the ones that were there. It was so awesome. I know Peter, that was stupid about the tent. That was dumb, but, but anyway, it was cool to be there, right? We, I think we're kind of important. We're the good people, right? We saw him raise the, that lady from the dead, that little girl from the dead, and now we saw this. Oh my gosh, we're awesome. Now the other ones are going... I can't believe we couldn't cast out that demon. I 
can't believe it. Why didn't we pray? I mean, we've been doing it before. We should have prayed. Why are we so stupid and blah, blah, blah. And so the, the discussion then starts. And Jesus, once again, he's revealed himself and he says, once again, I'm going to be killed, handed over, betrayed. I'm going to die, but then I'm going to race to life again. And they walk. They walk 20 miles. And I think Jesus is just leading them. And maybe he's listening in their conversation or maybe just he knows in the spirit what, he's, what they're saying, but it's kind of funny. They came to Capernaum, verse 33, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Now, I don't know if they understood that he knew what they were talking about, but it's just a funny question, right? Hey, I noticed you've been arguing for about two days uh, what, what were you arguing about? Now, they've argued a lot about amongst themselves, and they'll argue some more amongst themselves. It's not like a new thing. So to ask the question, and now the funny thing is, is they're completely silent, right? This is a rare thing for the disciples. Oftentimes, the disciples will hear a teaching from Jesus, and they'll go, mm, I don't quite get that. And so the next time they're together alone, he, they ask Jesus about, what, what, what exactly did you mean by that? Now, here it's funny because he tells them that he's going to be killed again, and they're completely quiet. They don't understand, and they were too afraid to ask. This time, he asks a question, and they all remain silent. It's like, wow, cat got your tongue. These disciples have forgotten how to speak, except when they're arguing amongst themselves. And what were they arguing about? Well, it says they kept quiet because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. Now, they're not talking about like LeBron or Michael, you know, who's the greatest there? It's like, or um, Tom and Peyton. They're not talking about that Jack or Tiger. They're not talking about who's the greatest player or quarterback or golfer. They're actually talking about who was the greatest amongst them, amongst the 12. I mean, like seriously, they just saw Jesus reveal the glory of God to him. I mean, can you believe? Yeah, I think I'm pretty good. I'm pretty cool like that. I might. It's like, no, no. How brainless are they? Jesus has constantly said, I, I want to sacrifice. I want to serve. I want to love. I want to give of myself. And that's what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. And they're, ah, you know, if he dies, maybe I'll get to be in the. Seriously? And then it's funny, because Jesus then decides, I'm going to teach him something. And, and usually a rabbi, when he would teach, he would sit down. That was kind of the, the place that they, you know, they, oftentimes they, they spoke to read the word of God, and then the rabbi would sit down, and, and that was when school began. That's when you're really teaching. And so it does say that, that Jesus sits down after... They've been discussing, arguing amongst themselves for two days on this long journey about which one of them is the greatest. Jesus sits down and says, come here, everybody. Now, I don't know if he's let on yet that he knows, but this, he just drops like a bomb in the middle of it. He says, <clears throat> if anyone wants to be first, and at that point, they all swallow hard, shoot, he knows what we were talking about. Oh, I've, and like, have you ever had that little moment that conviction just hits hard and the weight of it just oh, squeezes? I just said something really stupid this past week and my wife called me and immediately she said, hey, about last night, and I went, yeah, I know. Ah, uh, yeah, that was bad. Shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have said that. Just the, the weight of it, like, and it doesn't take much, right? It's just a little, hey, um... If you want to be first, if you want to be greatest, and they go, oh my gosh, I can't believe he knows. If you want to be first, you must be the very last and the servant of all. Now, I think he uses that little phrase, he lays it out there, and just lets them mull over it for a while. I was thinking about how many times in my own life am I trying to prop myself up, trying to raise my status among people, trying to make myself look better than I really am. How often do you do that? Like, that's just kind of how the world works, right? We're always trying to one-up somebody else. If we can push them down a little bit, we can get a little higher, and that's, that's kind of what the, 
the disciples are doing on their long walk. They're kind of pointing out, well, the last time you did try to cast out that demon, you couldn't even pull it off. And so he just says, if you want to be first, you need to be the very last and the servant of all. I think it's like a, a quake, you know, like where you know, the mushroom cloud hits and the waves of just power go right through them. Oh, and he just leaves it there. Let's him sit in that for a little while. And then he does an amazing thing. Amazing teacher this guy is, right? He goes and gets a little kid. He grabs the little kid, takes him by the hand, come here, and sets him right in front of him and just sits there for a while. Now, you got to understand that in the culture, this little kid is about the lowliest of everyone. No power, no status, no nothing. He is almost like a slave. In the household of Jewish homes in those days, the the man of the house, the dad or the father or the husband or whatever, um, he's like the grand poobah. The wife is just a little bit farther down, maybe a lot farther down, but then the kids and the slaves are almost in the same place. So this little child who's standing in front of them after he's delivered this, if you want to be first, you're going to have to be the very last and the servant of all. I mean, they know what this means. Oh, this kid is that. And he just leaves him there for a while. I got to gotta wonder what the kid's thinking, right? Why are these people looking at me like this? Why do they look mad at me? Why is there shame all over their faces? Jesus, are you going to do something about this soon? Okay. And then Jesus does an amazing thing. He just comes up, grabs a little kid who literally is of lowliest status, no power, no nothing, and he embraces him. He just picks him up and embraces him. You ever picked up a kid and like maybe they're a little tired and they just nestle their head on your shoulder and they just kind of fall and like limp in your arms? That's what I think this kid is doing because, oh, thank you. I was so uncomfortable right there. And Jesus just hugs him. And he says, you need to welcome this kind of a person. Like they already know that They've been trying to climb the social ladder or the discipleship ladder. They're trying to get higher and higher and higher and, and say that they're greater than somebody else. And he says, no, 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 no. Why don't we go down? Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name and welcomes, like what receives, invites in, um, embraces. Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. It's how you act toward me. You have to, I want to see it in the way you treat people who are very different from you, very much down the social status from you. And whoever welcomes this person is not really welcoming me, but the one who has sent me. The way you treat people like this is the way I understand what you feel about God. Now, I don't know, I don't know how to thing happened to me a couple of years ago. It was kind of strange. Um, I was leaving at one church and starting another one, and there was a person who was uh, part of that group who had been a pastor for many years, years before. And um, so one, a church had asked me to come and, and um, consider being their pastor. And I, I thought about it, but then this guy came to me and said, hey, I really feel God's calling on my life to get back into ministry and be their pastor. And I went, yes, yes, I confirm that. I, that's perfect. Go ahead and do that. Uh, and so we were praying through that for a couple of weeks. And in the meantime, his wife sent me a scathing letter. Just ripped me up and down, called me all kinds of names, told me how horrible I was for not allowing this guy to be active, more active in this little church startup. I knew at the time that he was thinking about moving on to a different place. And so we were praying through that. I could tell by the letter, though, that she was not aware that he was thinking about doing that. And so um, I just kind of let it go. I didn't really um, act on it. About three months later, I went to a conference. 
And it was a conference that a friend of mine was putting on. They were going to put it on here, but because of whatever happened, um, they moved it to Cleveland. And so it was two guys, uh, Dallas Willard, who is my favorite author in the world, and Richard Foster, another guy who's kind of a contemplative, talks about prayer a lot, talks about drawing close to God. And so those two were putting on the conference. At the end of the conference, they asked... um, they asked pastors who'd just been, you know, through difficult things to come forward for prayer. And so I went forward for prayer. It was a great time with the Lord and um, just healed my heart a little bit. Afterwards, I'm walking up the aisle to a group of people, like uh, a group of like people that I knew pretty well. Maybe there were six or seven or eight of them. And in the middle of that group was this woman, this woman who wrote the wonderful letter to me. And her husband was there and some other people that I knew. And so I walked up, and, and you know, I just kind of had a little mess, you know, I was, I was uncomfortable, in the, and, and the woman who had written the horrible letter to me stepped forward to give me a hug. Oh, really? How convenient to do that amongst all these people, so if I don't do anything right now, I look like the bad guy. I don't know if this stuff runs around your head, but it does run around mine. As my grandson would say, I want to take her by the hair, put her down. Um, <laughs> he, he watches too much WWE. Um, but um, obviously, I'm a man of God. I just spent a little time with the Lord. And so I, of course, stepped up, hugged her. I got to believe the disciples right now in this moment, when they look at the kid, he's the last person they want to hug. That woman was the last person I wanted to hug. Who is it in your life? Who is the last person you want to hug? Now, it might, that person might have a name, right? It might be a specific person that you're thinking of right now. It might be a kind of person or a a type of person. I don't know. Who would you least like to hug in that moment? Because I think that's where Jesus is going with this. Whoever welcomes that person in this moment, it's like you're welcoming me. And not just me, but my Father in heaven. That's how you become great in the kingdom of God. In fact, Luke actually says, uh, in talking about the same incident, it says, for he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Are you willing to become the very least of them all and welcome anyone? That's how you become great in the kingdom. But who is it that you would struggle with the most in reaching out to and welcoming and embracing. I think that's where maybe that might be the leading edge of your spiritual growth. You might need to speak to them. You might need to reach out to them. You might need to open your arms to them, right? Well, that's the kind of the first movement of the passage. That's where we have to focus first. Secondly, I think John says, I'm uncomfortable. I want out of this. Let's ask a question or just change the subject. So John says, teacher... Can we stop? Because I got, I got something else to say. But it's like he's, um, he's out of the frying pan into the fire. He says, teacher, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. It's like, wow, not one of us. He wasn't one of our tw- the 12. He wasn't a part of our clique. And we didn't like that, that he was doing it, and we couldn't do it before, but he, he was doing it, and so he, we said, stop it, because you're not one of us, which is like the first and probably the last time that Christians ever kind of created a clique and kept people out of it. Never happens now. doesn't happen at all anymore. It's great. Um, and uh, like John, like he's going to screw up again um, shortly. I wonder why, if, if they call him, like, son of thunder, you know, Bo and AJ's, if this is part of it. Because, like, I don't want to be that kind of son of thunder. I don't want to be, I want to be bold for Christ, but I don't want to be uh, moronic or stupid or whatever he's doing right here. He's just, that's bad. We told him to stop. He's not one of us. And Jesus says, <laughs> what? Don't stop him. Don't stop him. 
Are you kidding me? He's advancing the kingdom of God. He's thwarting the dark kingdom and the horrible things that could come through the enemy. And, and, and that's what I'm about. That's what I want to have happen. Just because he wasn't one of you doesn't mean he wasn't one of me. He wasn't part of my family. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. And then he, I mean, he, goes, he goes to the very bottom, the, the simplest act you could do in a Middle Eastern society and culture would be to offer up a cup of cold water. That, they happen, that happens all the time. They're so hospitable. I mean, in fact, when I've walked through Middle Eastern villages, little villages where like no, nobody had anything of any value, they would like take all the apples off of a tree and, and give them to you. And, and whatever they had in their house to, to eat or drink, they would just give it to you. They would give everything they had to, to be hospitable, to show that you were welcome. And, and Jesus uses just one little cup of cold water. Whoever, whoever just, just offers up this, this cup of cold water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. A number of weeks ago, we talked about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were all about trying to see who was in and who was out, and they would create these very large barriers to, to who could be in, and usually it was their rules and the commands of God. Their commands of God, 613 of them, and then their rules were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And Jesus came and said, I don't like that. That's not what I'm about. In fact, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They just follow these rules that were written down by man, and they don't even care about the commands of God. That's in a couple chapters ago. Those were the Pharisees. Those were the scribes. Those were the teachers of the law. Those were the enemies of Jesus. Now his disciples have said, hey, we told him to stop because he wasn't in our group. He wasn't in. He's out. And Jesus goes, oh, you, you want to be great and you want to keep people out? Are, are you learning only from the Pharisees and not from me? Do you understand that that's not what I'm about? In fact, I'm trying to press the boundaries farther and farther out. I, it's not even about boundaries anymore. It's not about who's in or who's out. It's, it's about where their heart is. And this person is casting out a demon. They're doing a miracle in my name. Anyone who does that cannot then say a horrible thing about me. Their hearts have been completely directed toward me, and they're moving toward me. I want them to keep on doing that. Because the farther they walk and the closer they get to me, I can have their heart. They're giving me more and more of their heart. They're surrendering more and more of themselves to me. In fact, even if anyone would just offer up a cup of cold water to me. I'm going to reward them because I can tell that their hearts are now moving toward me. And that I want to celebrate. Love no matter what. Embrace no matter what. Welcome no matter what. Invite in no matter what. This is what Jesus is all about. Now, when I think about this, and we've gone through this in the Gospel of Mark for a while now, and Jesus is continually opening up the doors to anyone and everyone. Well, what about sin, right? Because, like, don't you start thinking about that? I mean, what about the rules? What about following God's teaching? What about sin? And, and Jesus isn't, like, he's not, a, he's not pro-sin. In fact, we're going to hear this now, where we have to kind of, refocus our, our eyes on, on what Jesus is saying. First, he's really talking about the idea of a community of people not leading others into sin. If anyone causes one of these little ones, and the little kid is still in their midst, if you cause one of these little people, these little low status, they don't mean anything in, I mean, to anybody, if you would cause them to sin, oh, it would be better for you to have a huge millstone. And you got to understand, they're in Capernaum. This is where they make millstones. This is like the GE of millstones. You know, this is where they make them. And they're right by the sea. It's not like they're going, hmm, I wonder what that would be like. No, they're looking at a millstone. It's huge. It's four feet high and it's about two feet thick. Really, really heavy. I mean, I could lift it, but I mean, for you guys, it'd be hard. Um, and it's got a hole in the middle. 
And so you could literally wrap a, a thing around it and wrap it around somebody's neck. And they're imagining, wait, 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 if I cause somebody like this, I mean, first I gotta welcome them, I gotta love them, I gotta embrace them, and now if I do anything to to make them sin or to lead them into sin, it would be better for me to have this huge thing tied around my neck and thrown to the depths of the Sea of Galilee to sink to the 87th foot down deep. Okay, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't think I want to do that at all. So it's about, you don't want to lead anyone into sin, but you also don't want to sin. If your hand caused you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go into the hell. If your foot caused you the same thing, do not, do not, do not sin. We were talking about love no matter what. I think Jesus would say, do not sin no matter what. It's destructive. And that's the idea that he's talking about here. He's not really saying cut it off, but I suppose if you need to, go ahead, because it would be wise, he says. But you don't have to. It's just... It is so destructive. It would be better for you to take it off, get rid of it, than to, than to go and continue to sin and be in danger. This is a massive warning against sin. Um, Tuesday, I was down at a funeral. A friend of mine met him many years ago, probably 23 years ago. And uh, him and his wife had come to the first service of one of our um, church we planted. And their little boy, who was four days old, came. And, and we became really good friends with them. They were both in the residency program. They are going to be doctors. And so they were crazy busy. And so we just tried to serve them and love them. And um, I think <laughs> Christopher wouldn't sleep very well. So I'd go over there to his house. And, and so they could sleep. I'd just hang out with him because I didn't sleep that much anyway. So it was convenient. Um, but we just, we just loved them, and they were, they were good friends, and we went on vacation with them, and we, um, they moved a few times, and so we kind of lost contact with them in the sense that we didn't see them all the time, but we still would see them in, on vacation in different places, and um, I started noticing something about his life, and it was, and it was, it was bad. It was, it was sinful, and I remember telling uh, the wife, I, I, and talking to him, and it's like, I, this is really not good. I, I see some things in your life, and we try to walk with them through it. Uh, but eventually, they got divorced, and um, kind of lost touch with him, and still know his first wife very well. He eventually got married again, and I, but I don't think anything really changed in his life. He struggled he continued to struggle with the same thing. And um, a couple weeks ago, while he was sleeping, he was shot in the head and killed. 50 years old, a guy I knew very well, and going down and seeing him in his coffin, this passage kind of came like whew, right in front of my face. The destructive nature of sin, what it costs people personally, and then what it does to the people around them. Think of his kids, his friends, the destruction that has come because of this. It'd be better to just get rid of sin than to be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. And that's a horrible picture. Worm, it's probably maggots, which I think is more disgusting, although I don't like worms either, but just the idea of death, necrotic stuff where somebody just kind of keeps on eating at it and just continues to burn no matter what. The, the nature of, of the punishment for sin, for those who have never trusted Christ, it's just, it's just unbelievable. And then he goes into this phrase, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. And once again, I think we have to refocus our minds. And this is a hard passage. Not many people really have a good sense of what this is. The only people that I've found that kind of have spoken about this passage that sort of um, continues the flow of the, the discussion is 
uh, in the Old Testament, there was a certain sacrifice that was made. And when you made the sacrifice, you would throw salt into the fire because then the fire would become more hot and it would become, uh, it would refine the sacrifice better. Um, it became like a stoking the fire with this, this salt. And then the idea of, of Jesus saying, I really do want your life to be pure. I, I want you to be purified through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And certainly he's been leveling that on his disciples the whole time. But then it says salt is good. If it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? And then he says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. And so the idea is, and the, the phrase in the Old Testament is the covenant of salt, that together as a, as a people, as the chosen people of God, the, the salt would go into the fire, the fire would be refined, and, and the whole of the community would be refined. So they wouldn't make each other sin and... So my understanding, at least, of what Jesus is saying is that a group of people coming together should first welcome literally anyone and everyone who is moving toward Jesus. That they shouldn't keep anybody away or keep anyone on the outside, but their lives amongst themselves should be perfectly holy so that in no way it would keep somebody from coming into their midst and being in awe of the God that they serve and that it would, in fact, create a bond together. Now, I don't know what you do with all of this. I mean, there was just this and this and this and this. I do think there is a comprehensive whole, though, about what Jesus is asking us to do with a world out there who is in bondage to sin and is seeking, maybe, a God who will even reach out to them and bring them in. I'm going to bring the band up here, and we're going to worship, but let me ask you just a few questions. Who is the person right now that you are least willing to reach out and embrace? What is the boundary right now that you struggle with in, in welcoming somebody into the community to begin to seek after Jesus? And what is it in your life right now that is maybe keeping somebody from wanting to investigate who Jesus is? Heavenly Father, we come to you I think you give us opportunities to examine ourselves.